Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. that time of year again. Ten-year-old boys, 13-year-old boys, in some places, 16-year-old boys put on a brown bathrobe and a beige towel on their heads that is kept in place by one of their dad's old ties. Out of the church's prop closet comes an old staff and in front of parents and church friends and out-of-town visitors, the young men walk down the church aisle with an equally embarrassed girl dressed in blue. Usually the boys keep their eyes cast down and stand close to a dubiously made hay holder that wouldn't last a real winter feeding livestock in a barn. They look down on a doll or maybe a live human being and after the Three Kings song, they help the girl in blue up and walk back down the aisle and out the church door. It's that time of year again. When the creches, the manger scenes come out and on a table or a mountain a mantle or near a pagan decorated tree, a stall is placed and on the roof stands an angel. And to the side rests a lamb and a cow and maybe a donkey. A couple of shepherds crowd the doorway and just inside are three richly dressed male figures holding boxes or jars in the center of the scene, always in the center of the scene, is a woman kneeling, placed very, very close to a manger. A tiny baby figure rests inside, and of course, close, but not as close, stands a male figure with a staff. It's that time of year again, and I come of the shadows and am remembered as a dressed up kid or a tiny figurine. The rest of the year, the rest of the year when people see me, it's in paintings in museums and there I'm always drawn old and frail and typically in the background. My wife is front and center and I'm often partially obscured by an angel. Its wings blot out my robe and my feet and my legs. Sometimes, sometimes the church made the odd decision that the mother of God, the mother of the Son, must always and ever be chaste. And so, and so I became an ancient man and the brothers and sisters, clearly mentioned in Holy Scriptures, became children from a previous marriage in my much earlier days. The church married a 15-year-old Mary off to an 80-year-old Joseph. And that was more seemly than a normal, loving, intimate human relationship? Yes. I have a complicated place in the lore of saints. You will not find many statues of me in cathedrals. There are very few Joseph chapels to the side of the main altars. People don't call me blessed for generations. There isn't a hymn or a carol that honors my name, but I am the patron saint of the new world. More places are named after me than anyone else in the world. I am the saint of families and travelers, pregnant women, immigrants, house sellers, house buyers, craftsmen, 
and engineers. I am the saint of a happy, peaceful death. Late in the last century, late in the last century, I became the subject of a new division of theology, and Pope Francis recently added my name to three Eucharistic prayers. So the church doctrine defines me in one way. The Christmas story shows another side. This is how I see myself. My name is Joseph, and I am a Jew. I descend from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesse, David, and Solomon. I am of the covenant. I am part of that promise where the great I am said, I will be your God and you will be my people. This is my first and this is my primary identity. My second is this. I am a Nazarene. I was born and lived most of my life in that lovely but inconsequential village. I grew up in a loving home. I followed, I followed my father, Jacob, and my grandfather, Nathan, in their trade. I was a craftsman. I was a carpenter, which in my time was an admired, stable profession. We weren't of the one percent. We were not wealthy by any means, but we did not live hand to mouth. We were not nomads, and we were not outcasts. We made a sustainable living, and all the kids in the family could go to school and could study the tenets of our faith and our history with our God. And when we were very, very young, very, very young together, near the same age, Mary's parents and my parents pledged us to one another. As we grew up together, we were happy with their decision. Mary and I were well suited. We liked each other, and that like grew to love. Of course it would. Of course it would. If the plan was, if the plan was to send his own into the world to live a fully human experience, of course. He would want the child, the boy, the teen, the man to grow up in a loving, fully human family with care and respect and laughing and arguments and reconciliations. Mary and I could and we did provide that experience. And here's what to know about Mary. She was introverted. And she did process things internally. And she wasn't a flibberty gibbet. And she wasn't overly dramatic. And she was steady, and she was kind, and she was comforting, and she was comfortable in her own skin. Sometimes she portrayed as meek and mild, but Mary wasn't passive. Remember this. The Holy Spirit didn't come upon her before she said yes. And here's the truth about me. I'm not an exceptional man. I'm not just being modest or begging a question, hoping that you'll disagree. I mean, it's God's truth. I'm not exceptional. I'm not even the brightest, the smartest, the most charming of my father's sons. If asked, my mother would say, and my aunts would say, my uncles would say, the rabbi would say, my good friends would say, Joseph, he's loyal, he's reliable, he's steady. It's not a glamorous reference, but it seems to fit. I'm not exceptional, but apparently I didn't need to be. When it happened, of course, I was unprepared. How could I not be? It had been years. It had been
had been years and years and years since Samuel had had visions, and it had been eons since the prophets had encountered oracles. And who did I know who had had such an experience? And who had did I know who had known someone who had had such an experience? This was uncharted territory for me. And I was such an unlikely candidate for an audience with a holy messenger from the Most Holy. I wondered. And I knew everyone else would wonder too. Why him? Who is he that he should receive such news? I haven't said this before. But I'm not like Mary. I didn't always and ever have unquestioning faith, unwavering devotion. I was righteous, and I was faithful, but I wasn't always pious, and I sometimes had doubts. Frankly, I loved the Lord, but I'd as soon kept Him a little further away. It wasn't to be. I was brought close, so close, so, so close, fresh hay, cold night, and yes, again, I wasn't called blessed for generations. I disappeared from the narrative pretty early. I was at the temple. I was in the vicinity of the temple when I picked up the scroll and read. But I wasn't at the Jordan River when he met John, and I wasn't on the mount when 5,000 were fed, and I didn't see blind men regaining their sight. I wasn't at Gethsemane, and I wasn't at the cross. But when it counted, I did my part. Here's what I want you to understand. Sometimes, sometimes God does pick exceptional people to work out his purposes. Joshua, Joshua was exceptional. David, David was exceptional. But more often, generally, most times, God picks the ordinary. One of your contemporary writers, Madeline Engel, says, We are all asked to do more than we can do. Every hero, every heroine of the Bible does more than he would have thought possible to do, from Gideon to Esther to Mary. That was true of me. gives all that is required for that purpose to be worked out. So in this season, as you prepare for the coming of the Christ child, in this season, as you prepare for his coming again, remember this. When you have a dream or a vision or a thought that won't go away, when you have an urging in your heart, pay attention. 